talk. So, so this is a rather high-level talk, so, so I want to talk a little bit about how can we apply machine learning to medical image uh, analysis. And um, we have seen already, so what is machine learning? Uh, in, in a summary, in a nutshell, it's really just a field of study in computer science and statistics uh, where we try to build computers that are able to learn from data instead of explicitly programming them and hard coding decisions. And most of machine learning is categorized in these two types of um, things, which is unsupervised learning and supervised learning. And really everything you probably read currently about, which is about AI and, and use of AI for new applications, is in the domain of supervised learning, where we build models from training data. So we expose a lot of data with annotations to our models, and the models get adapted to uh, perform a specific task. So supervised learning is really about this model is in the, in the center, and then you have to collect training data. So you give the model examples of what it should do, and then hopefully it can later on, on new data, make sensible predictions. Here are just some examples of um, supervised learning. So often we talk about classification problems and regression problems. They are really, from a machine learning per perspective, not that different. It's more about a categorization of the output of a model. So in classification, we predict what qualitative outputs, while in regression, we predict quantitative outputs. So a typical example would be where you have maybe data coming from two different categories, let's say people with a, uh, with a tumor and non-tumor people. Uh, we extract some features, maybe from imaging or non-imaging information. We try to find these decision boundaries that would allow us to classify a new uh, patient where we can collect the same uh, features, but we would like to know whether that person might develop cancer or not. While in regression it's a bit different, so we also have sets of features, and what we are trying to predict is a uh, continuous or quantitative output. So we are usually fitting some sort of function that maps input to output. Linear regression, as probably most of you know, could be considered in this context as a machine learning uh, method. And then, of course, it depends what type of function you fit. So whether you choose the model and what the model capacity is, for instance, if you just say it can be a regression line, you will get certain outputs. If you choose a higher order polynomial, you get different outputs. So choosing the model will highly influence what predictions your model will do and how well it will represent your training data. Some examples from the medical domain. So tumor tissue classification given in MRI brain scan uh, could be seen as a classification problem, where every point in the image is now classified in one of uh, the different tissue type categories. In regression, we could look at things like brain uh, development. We could try to predict whether a, um, a baby is developing uh, in a normal way. We can do things like age regression. So given an MRI scan, we could try to predict what the age of the patient is. You might wonder, why would you do that? Normally, you should know the age of your patient, but actually, we, we see that these models uh, can allow us to predict if there's abnormality. So if you predict a different age from the actual uh, chronological age, that might indicate uh, some abnormality in the, in the an uh, anatomy. So here are a couple of examples where currently machine learning is used in medical imaging. Uh, a lot about this is, is on image segmentation, where we try to delineate certain types of structures either pathological or anatomical structures. For instance, here in this example, on the top we have a glioblastoma uh, patient where we automatically segment out the tumorous region, but we also classify it into different categories, like the, the active part, the, the necrotic part, and the edema. We can do things like uh, quantitative measurements in ultrasound by segmenting out the left ventricle. Uh, we can do this over time, for instance, in cardiac MRI, or we can segment uh, normal structures like the major organs in the whole body MRI. And these are all examples from, from research that, that, that comes out of, of, of our group, but also by, by others. One particular promising area is abnormality detection. So ideally, probably you as a radiologist often are faced with the problem of you're not exactly sure what you're looking for. So you're given a scan and you would like to detect whether there's something suspicious, something abnormal. So this is an example where we trained a system to detect abnormalities or lesions in diffusion MRI. Now, if you look at the diffusion scan, the lesions show up at these bright spots. So they are easy to see, but however, there are other regions which are the normal 
structures which might also light up in a similar way. So if you look at the uh, structural MRI scan, uh, you see that also there are not huge differences. However, our system here has learned to take context into account so it realizes whether you are in the liver region or whether you are on the vertebra and consequently you can correctly identify which are the tumorous lesions. There's a lot of interest in using machine learning to extract biomarkers. So segmentation, of course, gives you uh, something where you can look at uh, phenotypes and differences between different subjects. There's also a lot of interest to exchange information. So you could have different types of brain lesions and you could re relate them to, to clinical measures or non-imaging non information or demographics, uh, lifestyle, uh, genetics, and so on. Uh, we also have recently looked at a multitask uh, problem where you try to do the same thing of segmenting major organs in, for instance, MRI and CT. Uh, but for each of them, you might not have that amount of training data that you would normally need to train a system. But since the, the task is the same here, we actually could show that you can build systems that can learn from multi-model uh, images, which is quite nice. Or you can do uh, clinical studies, like for instance, analyzing the effect of um, certain clinical measures, let's say blood pressure on the uh, anatomy jointly on, on brain and cardiac by doing extractions using uh, machine learning techniques. Machine learning is also used in image reconstruction. So this is an example where we use a machine learning based reconstruction technique that can actually reconstruct high quality scans from heavily undersampled MRI. So this is interesting when you try to speed up the image acquisition. You can also apply this to super resolution. So basically what you're trying to do is to, to upsample uh, a, a low resolution, low quality scan that is pr probably often taken in clinical practice, like these um, uh, 2D uh, MRI sequences where you have a large uh, slice thickness, but high in-plane resolution using a machine learning based uh, approach that learns how to upsample the data by looking at examples of low and high resolution scans, you can actually do much better than naive uh, linear interpolation, for instance. There are many, many other applications. So we, we saw uh, a, a couple of uh, nice examples on computer added diagnosis. Of course, there's a lot of interest in using machine learning to do disease classification, outcome prediction, disease progression, um, decision support, but also on population health. So if we are given just very, very large amounts of data, what can we actually get out of this? So some people might know, for instance, studies like the UK Biobank Imaging Study, which is currently collecting uh, a comprehensive imaging uh, of 100,000 subjects. And if you want to correlate this to, to, with demographics, lifestyle, genetics, you need very good advanced uh, statistical tools to extract the relevant information from the images. So how do we apply machine learning to medical imaging? <clears throat> so, I'm, so I'm trying to give you a little bit of a recipe or, or maybe some of the uh, pitfalls that we saw earlier um, that you might want to take into account if you are, for instance, working in a, in a research environment and you're currently believing that maybe I should try machine learning to do some of my tasks. So I, I certainly believe, and, and we have seen in the previous speakers, that um, this is probably true, that currently machine learning can be applied to very specific tasks. And if you want to successfully use machine learning, you should first think about, do you have a well-defined task that you're trying to solve? So the approach of just believing you have large amounts of data and you can do anything with that is probably not the best way to get, to get started. Then obviously you need the right data, and I will talk about this a little bit more. Um, you need the right methods, so you need to have people in your team that know about uh, what type of methods you can use and what type of methods you cannot use. So you definitely need the right team. And I will talk about the team again because I believe the team is, is uh, essential in building successful uh, machine learning methods. And you have to have the right expectations. So just believing that you can uh, dump a lot of data on advanced machine learning techniques and hope that you get something out is probably not uh, not the right thing to, to have in mind. So I think it's really important to always keep in mind what machine learning is or what current, what, what people currently discuss as AI is really, it's a function approximation. You have input and you have output. 
And if there's no association between your input and outputs, machine learning will not work. So at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're fitting a function or you're trying to approximate a function, which might be very complex, and you might not know how that function looks like, but that's all you do when you use machine learning. So let's talk about the amount of data. So that's, I guess, one of the crucial points where everyone who starts machine learning, maybe in a clinical environment, is faced with at some point because you need to write an ethics approval to get the data that you can do research on. And the first question that comes up is, every time we talk to clinical people, they ask us, so how much data do you need? And probably what you will hear from the ML researcher is, how much do you have? Because we don't really can answer this question. And, and that's interesting, I think, to keep in mind. In machine learning, the way we use it at the moment, classical statistical assessments do not always apply. You cannot do just a power analysis and say, I need n number of subjects. That's not possible. We often only know afterwards whether it was enough or not. However, it's important to know that machine learning has mechanisms to determine whether more data would help. So I think we need to think about changes in the way that we, for instance, write ethics approvals. Um, they, they still ask for these questions. They want to know how many subjects do you need. So it's difficult to say. And, and if you work in a good team, then probably you have some experience and you have done a, a bit of machine learning in the past, and you might have a good starting point. You might say, I, I need maybe 50, 50 subjects to get started. So what happens then? So actually, so here's a simple technique that you can use to estimate whether you do need more data. So we have seen learning curves before, but this is a curve where we plot the error that your method does with respect to training size. And what you will see is, for instance, that a uh, case where you have a model that does on training not very well. So even on the training data, your method doesn't perform very well, but it's close to the test performance. If you're in this regime, which we call high bias in machine learning, more data won't help, right? If you just dump more data on this model, you see from the curves there's no hope that you will get somewhere down to a lower error. However, if you're in the regime where your training data, your training error is actually quite low already, but your test error is not there, so your model does not perform as well as you would hope, there's hope that with more training data, you can actually improve uh, your method. So there are mechanisms, you can do the analysis, but you need to have a starting point, you need to start somewhere. So data quality is another very important issue, I think. <clears throat> so I just want to, so Marlene has given a very nice example of uh, multi-center studies, where even within a hospital you might often use different scanners, different time points, and data quality might be very different in your, in your training data. When clinicians come to us, they often come with this Oh, we believe machine learning could be used. We have this large amounts of data where we have thousands of patients. They all had CT scans done, and we know exactly the outcome. We have all the clinical measurements. And as a machine learning researcher, that's my image. Right? So I believe, okay, they will give me this beautiful homogeneous data set that I can work with. However, in practice, once they bring me the data, that's probably more likely uh, how, how the data looks like. It's very heterogeneous. You will have all kinds of different things. And I'm not even talking about the non-imaging data here, where you have missing values, uh, incorrect spreadsheets, all kinds of labels, uh, labeling problems. <clears throat> so there's this concept of data readiness levels, which hasn't been established in medical imaging, but I think it should. So Neil Lawrence, machine learning researcher and director of uh, Amazon Research in Cambridge, has put this very nice paper, uh, position paper, where he discusses data readiness in the bigger context of machine learning. And then Hugh Harvey later discussed this a little bit in the context of medical imaging. And one of the things that Neil Lawrence said is data, data everywhere, not a set to process. And I think that's where we currently are many times when we go to, uh, to our clinical uh, collaborators. They believe the data is there, it might not be there. So what Neil Lawrence is suggesting is that data readiness could be defined in, in three different bands. There could be band C, which is just about the accessibility you might have a belief that the data is somewhere on your PUCs in your system or something, but you're, you're not entirely sure. There's band B where it's about faithfulness and representation. Let's assume the data is there. Is the data correct? Is any data missing? What's the format? And machine learning should really start when you have band A data. The appropriateness is important. Is the data that you have 
actually useful to solve your particular task. And I think if we come up with a way of classifying our medical imaging data, or maybe general medical data, that is quite important to uh, build successful machine learning tools. There's another aspect of learning the right features. So if you do use data from one side, you might be faced with this following problem. You want to do classification into benign and malignant, and your system will always learn the simplest feature that it can do. So if you're, if you're giving it site A training data in this case, it will learn color instead of shape. And only at test time you will find out it has learned the wrong features. So just to conclude and also hopefully end with a positive message, and maybe following up on, on Elliot's comment, uh, comment on computer scientists don't really see how clinicians can uh, uh, help here. Uh, I do believe they should, so, so I'm, I'm proposing this co-design that we should um, follow in machine learning, where really the clinical people need to be on board when we build machine learning systems. Building AI for clinical application requires domain expertise. We have seen this in Marlene's example, where gender was an important thing that we should have considered. The machine learning researcher might not have thought about this. It needs seamless integration into clinical workflows. And we need to keep the, the expert, which is the clinical expert and the ML expert, in the loop at all stages from design until development. So if you have come here to this session and to any other AI session at ECR, and you thought about what can I, AI do for you, you might also ask the question, what can you do for AI? And I really believe in this, that we need to build these uh, interdisciplinary teams to build successful machine learning systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.